Hey, good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts, man. I want to take this opportunity to personally welcome you again to another edition of our Sunday morning celebration broadcast right here on our closed campus. And so um, because of COVID-19, again, our campuses are closed and will continue to be so hopefully not much longer, man. We are missing every one of you and are looking forward to again coming back and being part of a family that gathers together exclusively to worship our God who is alive. But until then, man, we're, we're broadcasting this way. So with that said, in just a few moments, we're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to continue our, our looking at our, our subject matter of perilous times. Before we do, we have some family business to take care of. And, uh, you know, normally during this part of the service, when the campus is open, we will be uh, receiving of our tithes and offerings. So we want to give that opportunity to you opportunity to you to do that now as well. And there's several different ways that you can give of your tithes and offerings. Uh, two of them are digitally. The first one is you can text to give at 210-361-0060. That information should be on your screen right now, 210-361-0060. The other way that you can digitally uh, give up your tithes and offerings as you can go to our website at www.hgc.church. In the upper right hand corner there's going to be a drop down menu which will take you to a secure third party application that meets all the banking criteria, uh, uh, what they, you know, security measures and you can give with uh, confidence uh, that, 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 and sec with confidence and securely in the privacy of your own home using either debit card, credit card, or an e-check. Now, if giving digitally doesn't float your boat, that's all right, man, because you can continue to make your, a, a check or money order payable to HGC or His Grace Church. Drop it in the mail. The address is on your screen. at His Grace Church at 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway, right here in the... Uh, right here in, in the Alamo City of San Antonio, Texas, 78238, man. Kim and I are grateful that you uh, for your continued support of this ministry, even though the campus is closed, and your faithfulness to do so. We thank you, we appreciate you, and we love each and every one of you. And we miss you, man. That little teaser that we had, we were open for four weeks, and being able to be in each other's company and presence, man, did my heart good to see each and every one of you. Uh, but until that time again returns, again, then welcome to our digital broadcast right here from our closed campus here in San Antonio, Texas. So let's open with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into the word of God this morning. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we just thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you that the Word of God is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that this morning that the Holy Spirit has some things to say to us. And, and Father, I ask you, whole, actually Holy Spirit, I ask you to help me, to assist me, to um, provide the information in the correct manner where there be ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that will be open and receptive to hear. And so I thank you for this. I thank you for the boldness to speak under the unction and the anointing of the Holy One, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, today. And I give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I trust you do. If not, these scriptures will come up on the screen. But, man, I invite you to have something to take notes with. And as we study this subject, there's a lot of pertinent information and uh, it's so easy to forget things, but the great thing is, is that all of, our, all of our messages and MP4s are out on our website. And you can find that at www.hgc.church forward slash resources.html. And what that'll do is that's going to take you to our YouTube page. And there you're going to find a vast resource of of our multimedia presentations. And so if you haven't been with us the last couple of weeks on this particular subject or any subject, you can go out there 24 seven and you can then um, just feed on whatever you feel that 
is necessary for your own spiritual life that we have out there. All right. Amen. So, we have been looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and the title of this particular series is Perilous Times, taken directly from this context of Scripture. And Paul, writing under the inspiration and, and the direction of the Holy Spirit, writes to Timothy, and he says this, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. So we're going to take just a few moments and we're going to review uh, kind of this particular verse because it's an anchor verse that we're kind of building the rest of the series off of. And um, if we get too far out, out ahead without reviewing the anchor verse, sometimes we, we can lose the context of what we're, what we're teaching and speaking about. So Paul said, know this also that in the last days, perilous times will come. So within this particular passage of scripture, the first three words, this know also, uh, expresses a strong sense of emphatic urgency. Uh, the word this is the Greek word tautu, uh, which is um, by itself would just mean this, but in this case, it's pointing to something very specific. It's pointing to something very specific. And then w next we have the word also. This no also, or this, uh, which is the Greek word de, D-E, which is translated here as the word also. Similarly, it points to something emphatic, something that's going to occur. And by inserting the word day here, the Holy Spirit intensifies the tone of what he's about to say. In other words, it becomes more of a commanding tone of you need to listen to me. You know, like your parents used to do when they raised, they just kind of raise their voice just that one little octave. And that means, whoop. They're saying something that I need to hear, that I need to know. And this is kind of what the Holy Spirit is saying, because when he inserts the word that, this know also that, this again then is the Greek word hotai, and it's just like the words this and also, the word that points a specific and important point. By doing this, the Holy Spirit is then saying, basically, listen to me. This is something you absolutely, positively, and most emphatically need to know. Recognize and understand that in the last days, perilous times will and are going to come. The next word that we find in this particular passage of Scripture, this know also that in the last, that word last in the Greek, eschatos, it describes the ultimate end of a thing or the extreme end and it was used in, in classical greek literature and writings to depict basically the furthest point away or the farthest away that you could ever get such as such as the ends of the earth but it was also used as a navigational term and it depicted the final port or the last stopping off for a journey it would be like if you went on a cruise ship and you went to all these ports of call, and then the, the last port of call was your final destination. That, sh that ship was no longer going any further with you on it, and you were going to have to disembark. And so that's what this particular word is saying, that you're at the last, the last port of call, you're at the last place, or the last stopping off for your journey. And by using this word, the Holy Spirit then was speaking not only to Timothy, and the first century of believers, but he was also uh, speaking to us believers living at the end of the age. He was prophesying or pro proclaiming or declaring what was going to happen. So he was basically prophetically pointing his finger 2,000 years into the future and forecasting then what life would be like to the generation that was here at the last of the last, at the, the last stopping point, the furthest point away, and that final place before the departure of the church, the rapture of the church would occur. And so 
Essentially what he said is when the church of Jesus Christ sails to its last port and comes to the very end of time and can go no further, perilous times shall come. And then the Greek word, uh, perilous is the Greek word, uh, we won't even pronounce that, but the Greek word uh, for perilous, it, it, what it does, it describes... Yeah, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that Greek word. How's that for you this morning? It describes something dangerous, risky, hurtful. It pictures something that is wounding. So it is a word used in literature to depict a wild, vicious, uncontrollable animal or animals that were unpredictable and dangerous. And it depicts then also a deadly menace. This particular word, the Greek word, was also used to describe ugly words that when spoken are hurtful and emotionally hard to bear. It does carry the idea that in, of, it, of an action, a place, a person, or a thing that is harsh, harmful, and filled with high risk. Then we come to the word perilous times. Perilous times. And perilous times are filled with danger, risk, and hurt. So, they are wounding, unpredictable, potentially harmful, and become menacing. That's what it means. Perilous times. Perilous times. Are times that are filled with danger, risk, hurt. They are wounding, unpredictable, potentially harmful, and can be menacing. And if you really think about it, you know, a, another translation says that, <clears throat> I was reading another translation that they substituted the word perilous times for difficult times. So the end of the end of the age before the church is raptured out, before Jesus returns, is going to be very difficult times for society. And if, if you really think about if you really think about it, these are, the, these are the times in which we are kind of now living in, man. You know, many people are going about their day-to-day -day existence with, they're deeply wounded. Man, they're hurt emotionally. They carry scars of, of words that people have spoken over them. And so they have been wounded in the relationships. They've been wounded by society. And there's even people that have been wounded by the church. And as believers, we're appointed and anointed by God for in, in this season to bring the life-giving power of Jesus Christ and answers from his word to the hurting and wounded people that are around us. Then we, we, we move to the, the next phase. Let's know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Shall come. And this Greek word is in, in histamine. And it's compounded from the word in, E-N, which is in, and the word histami, histami, which means to stand. So, when these two words then are compounded to form the word in estimate, we find that this word then here is translated into our English word, shall come. And it means to stand in the middle of, or to be surrounded by something, or to be encumbered by something. And it carries the idea of standing in the very middle of whatever is being discussed. In the very middle of it. And by using this word, the Holy Spirit is saying, those who are living at the very ultimate end of the age are going to feel like they're standing in the very middle of these difficult times, of these perilous times, and they're going to, it's going to be as though they're surrounded on all sides by confusion, civil behavior, and chaotic nonsense. <clears throat> now, if we think about the bizarre and blasphemous, you know, types of entertainment coming out of Hollywood, the godless and perverse educations in the classrooms, and the unbelievable decisions that are being handed down by our courts, it would almost seem as though we're being assailed from every side and, 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 and these things are beginning to serve as a, as a concrete confirmation that maybe we are indeed at the end of the end of this particular age or dispensation. So putting all these words together here, 
I like the interpretive version that this minister uh, gave of Timothy chapter 3, 1, using the Greek and the, the actual uh, definitions of the words in Greek. He rewrote this to kind of sound according to what it was really saying. We have the short version, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. But if we add in the definitions that we just looked at, it would read something like this. You emphatically and categor categorically need to know with unquestionable certainty that in the very end of days, now this is 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, when time has sailed to its last port and no more time remains for the journey, that last season will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable and unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times that will be emotionally difficult for people to bear. Then immediately after this verse, Paul lists out 25 characteristics, characteristics describing then what the last days of the last days will be like for those that are still living on the earth. And that's kind of where we've left off. We've, we've started already. Uh, we've kind of unboxed the first four characteristics, which we found in verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. And today we're going to be looking at blasphemers. And depending on our time, we may look at disobedient to parents. But if not... Hallelujah, we'll look, we'll look at that next week for sure. So the, the fifth characteristic that we're going to see in a last day society, the last of the last of the last day society before the rapture of the church, before Jesus comes, however you want to say it. And let me say this again. I understand, so, you know, I want you to know for a fact that I don't know for a fact when Jesus is coming back. The Bible says that no man knows the hour or the day or the time but the Father. And so the Father knows when it's going to happen, but what he did do is to help the church to prepare, his people be prepared for when that time was going to come. He had Paul 2,000 years ago under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing to the church uh, at Ephesus and writing in that time frame to that church he also prophetically spoke of a time that would come and we would know we were in that time by what was written in the Word of God. And so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these 25 characteristics that are described in what the last days will be like before Jesus returns. So I'm in no way declaring that today's the day, tomorrow's the day, the next day. I'm not putting a date or a time stamp on it. I'm just saying that there's a road map and directions that were given by the Holy Spirit to help us and to assist us to know what time of, of, that we're in in the season of God and then to help us prepare um, for that particular season as well. And then, because of what was going to be occurring within this dispensation, not to, not to operate in the fear that is going to begin to transcend the earth because of all these characteristics coming to pass. So, the fifth characteristic abounding in the last days then that we're going to look at is the increased presence of 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 those that the Bible calls blasphemers in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. Blasphemers is the Greek word blas, blas, blasphemo. I like to say blasphemo. And so, but really what this word means, it means to slander, to accuse, to speak against, or to speak derogatory words for the purpose of injuring harming one's reputation. It also then signifies profane, foul, unclean language. It can refer to blaspheming the divine. But in general, what it means is that it is any derogatory speech intended to defame, defame injure, or harm another person's reputation. So, 
if we look at this and we look at the broader meaning of this, it, it, it includes any type of demeaning, derogatory, nasty, shameful, ugly speech or behavior intended to humiliate someone. It's crude. It's rude behavior. That's all it is. Crude and rude behavior. So the word blasphemo denotes speaking slanderously or railing against someone by bringing abusive, demeaning, degrading accusations against those with whom that person disagrees with or they don't agree with. And many times this includes the use of curse words, but it's not predominantly, uh, but it is predominantly rude, crude speech. Though it can include curse words, predominantly is crude and rude speech. And here's what we've, we've, here's what we've found. Those that are proud, those that they believe they are the agenda sitters for the rest of the society, then from their lofty position that they think they own, they will begin to demean anyone who they feel are below them or, or who disagrees with their ideology. And they're going to do this with derogatory words. I mean, does that sound like anything that's maybe popped up recently? I mean, have we seen this in our society and within our culture? I think kind of we have. And I want to give you some hypothetical situations. But I, I believe that one of the new words that we see popping up that, that can help us probably give us a, a good example of maybe this particular word, um, instead of saying, and that would be what we'd call cancer culture. In other words, what is the cancel culture? It just basically says, if you, do, if you do not believe what we believe and think the way we think, we're going to shut you down. We're going to shut you down. We're going to remove your business and destroy your life socially and professionally. We're going to come after you for the sole purpose of destruction. Why? Because you don't agree with us. And they do this many times by speaking slanderously, or railing against someone by bringing abusive, demeaning, degrading accusations against those with someone they don't agree with, whether it's true or not. Now, I believe that you, we should speak the truth in love. But this isn't what we're talking about. Many times, they're just coming against people because they don't agree with their ideology, their opinion, or their expression. And... Because they don't agree with it, they will, they will do their best to bring destruction professionally, personally, morally. However they can bring that person or entity down, it knows no bounds. They will do this. And they will do it even if it's not true. Because they believe it to be true. Here's an example. What I call many times these progressive thinkers uh, will begin to demean those who believe maybe in the Bible. People like myself that believe what the Word of God says. And so I've heard this as, you know, in the public forum many times. Because we don't think the way they think, they try to, to demean us by calling people like myself narrow-minded because, you know, we think according to the way the Bible tells us to think, so now we're narrow-minded. Uh, we're relics of the past because in their mind, they're a more enlightened thinker. You see, we're, 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 thinking, the, we're thinking thoughts of God. We're thinking in line with the Word of God. But that's not their progressive enlightened thinking because the Bible's outdated. The Bible is, is, you know, past tense. And when it comes to the Bible and what it has to say, you know, they just believe that it's out. It's out. I mean, it doesn't match society. It's a useless book. And um, the more progressive then they become in their thinking, we find that they become educated. 
and they're in their thinking process and then within that thinking process it becomes more liberal meaning that they're more uh, rightfully acceptance of the 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 wrong moral values and society's morals over what the word of god says and then they then they believe then that the bible is basically too confining and is not up with the times of society because you know these people understand um, that the Bible is outdated. But the Bible has never gone out of date, people. It's never, it's never ceased to exist. It is a guideline to keep, keep in check the human race and the morals of people. And we use these to govern our lives because God is life. And, you know, he's given us choice. He calls us to either choose life or death. And sin will always lead us to death. And God's word is not to prevent us from having a good time and enjoying life, but is to keep us in a healthy, unsinful life, which is productive into life and all godliness. But these enlightened thinkers, these, these progressive thinkers, then are, are tolerant of the social and moral issues that govern culture today, where the Bible and its believers then become intolerant to society's newfounded morals of anything goes. <clears throat> they label us some sort of, no matter what it is, phobic is at the end of it. Because I, I agree with the Word of God. I agree with the principles in the Word of God. And my thinking lines up with the Word of God. And I meditate on the Word of God. I reflect on it. I study it. And then I live it and I act it. And because I do this, I'm not considered an enlightened, progressive thinker. I, I'm basically a relic uh, that's, I mean, uh, I'm a slave to God. I'm a slave to the Bible. No, I choose. I'm choosing. I'm choosing this particular lifestyle. Just like each and every one of us have choices. People are making choices that are contrary to the Word of God. But that's their decision. But these particular people... They, they, they like to say things like, this is a new day and age. It's a new time. <laughs> I like this one. You Bible thumpers are behind the times in your old age thinking. The Bible isn't progressive enough. Society has outgrown the Bible. You're relics of the past. And what they begin to do then is they begin to blasphemo. They begin to blaspheme they begin to blaspheme. That means they begin to speak derogatorily of anybody that does not agree with their plan, agenda, ideology, and that progressive thinking. We see it in culture in every area. If you don't think the way I think, I'm going to shut you down. I'm going to label you a label to prevent you from having a voice in society. You are not worthy to be able to, to voice your beliefs in society. You're outdated. You're a relic. Your thought process is no good. It doesn't, it doesn't stand up with us liberal progressive thinkers uh, of society. Our, the intellectual ones that are setting the agendas. But God's word never comes to an end. And when this dispensation ends, and the next dispensation, which is the, which is the, uh, the seven years of tribulation, and then Jesus comes back, the first time Jesus comes back, he's actually not setting foot on the earth. Only the church is going to see him. But the second time he comes back, the, the church is going to be with him, and all will see him. And then it's going to be the judgment. So these people then begin to speak derogatorily of anybody that does not agree with their plan, agenda, ideology, or progressive thinking. And you know, I, 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 took, I took this example right directly from the news. I thought it was a good example. You may not agree with me, and I respect that, but... But here's a great example of what I consider blasphemo uh, in operation and in today's society and culture.
This week or last week, the president of Goya Foods expressed his opinion of the president while attending a function at the White House that he was invited to, and he was asked to be a part of a commission that called the White House Hispanic Prosperity Initiative. And he said, and I'll quote him directly, they called on us to be there to see how we could help opportunities within the economical and educa educational realm for prosperity among Hispanics and among the United States. And based on what he saw and heard within this particular meeting with the president on this day, which was that the president signed an executive order on the White House his, on the White House Hispanic Prosperity Initiative to use more tax dollars and taxpayer support for private and charter schools to improve access by Hispanic Americans to education and economic opportunities. This is what this man said, end quote. So after being part of this historic signing, he made this comment and he stated, we're all truly blessed at the same time to have a leader like President Trump who is a builder. The moment that he stated that, immediately the critics, politicians, and celebrities took aim at the company on social media with hashtags like boycott Goya, go away Goya. And so immediately, because he said something they disagreed with, they came after him. And many within this movement urged people who use Goya products to start buying comparable foods from the company's competitors. People began to angrily attack this man because he said something they didn't agree with. He made a positive reference to something the collective, the progressive thinkers, whatever you want to call them, these people disagreed with him. And because he did this, They were like hornets. And what did he say that was so evil? What did he say that in his opinion was so evil? All he did was he praised a sitting president and he said, and I quote, we're all truly blessed at the same time to have a leader like President Trump, who is a builder. But according to the New Society of Progressive Thinkers, he was not allowed his opinion. And because he made this comment, which the collective progress, the progressive thinkers disapproved of, he needed to be punished. So they began to derogatorily come after him, speak of him in a, in a demeaning manner, not only of him, his business, his business ethics, and his character, because he did not agree with their plan, agenda, ideology, and progressive thinking concerning the president, within this particular situation. This is the Greek word blasphemo. This particular CEO called the pushback against him while visiting the White House a suppression of speech. Blasphemo. This is exactly what we talked about last week when we studied the word proud. That in the last days, in the last days, there were going to be types of people who believe they are the ones, and only they are the ones that determine social, public, and community policies, and they will tell everyone else what to think, what to believe, and what to do in the process. And that's exactly what they began to do with the pushback. Don't buy their product. Don't do this. Don't do that, because this man is wrong, and we are the right ones. And... Again, the Holy Spirit is telling us that in the last days there will be a group in society who see themselves being intellectually advantaged by, you know, by everybody else. They're, they're, they're above everybody else. They are the progressive thinkers and they're going to see themselves as the ones who make the plans for all of us. We can't think on our own. We can't have a thought process. And this is what they were telling this gentleman who's the CEO of Goya. You can't think that way it's wrong and because you have come out and supported this particular initiative and you have supported this particular man we are going to come after you in a demeaning derogatory and slanderous manner and try to destroy your business your ethics your character and anything we can because you don't agree with us 
And that is what blasphemo means. And so, when this happens, what they're wanting us to do is they want us to come in line and to follow them, or else. Or else we will bring this, this dark, we'll bring hell with us to destroy you, basically is what they're saying. We're going to do whatever we can do to stop your voice in the community because you're wrong and we are right. And you must follow us or else. Or else what? We will destroy you. We will destroy your family. We will destroy your business, your reputation, and everything else you are connected to. Just ask yourself if you've seen any of this recently in the media. This is the story of Goya food. It's a good illustration of blasphemo. You know, and should you then post a, a, a reproach to this particular dilemma or any dilemma that you're being called out on in social media, they'll send you a message. Your comment does not meet our community standards and we have locked your account. They don't want you to have a collective voice outside of the voice. And if you speak anything other than what they expect you to speak, then they're going to blaspheme you. They're going to come after you. They're going to make sure that um, they, they destroy everything they can about you. People then are going to angrily attack you because you had the gall to say something outside the collective and the new society's way of thinking. We see, we see a lot now in nations that would never have censored religious beliefs or views, beginning to censor them based upon society. You can't say that. You can't say this. You don't do this. If you do, you're, you're, you're labeled with a label to prevent you from, from proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in truth. Nations are being demoralized and taken over by progressive thinkers and, and intellectuals that don't even believe the word of God. And they're structuring nations around that. And we're seeing, and we're seeing vast failures within leadership. But thank God, this, none of this caught them off guard. And God is still working in the background and I believe what the Bible says if we will humble ourselves and pray he will heal our land but we're too busy fighting with each, with each other to begin to pray together with each other for God to heal our land you know so when we have people running around angrily attacking us because you know we don't agree with their opinion we stood up to what we believe and that's the word, what we believe, just like they're standing up for their beliefs. And I applaud people that stand up for their beliefs. But we ought to have the opportunity to be able to be civil about our disagreements of our beliefs. And that has been taken away and that's going to be continually removed from society because we're not allowed to disagree with the collective progressive intellectual thinkers anymore. And so it kind of reminds me, I don't know if... Um, Kim and I, my wife and I, Kim, we like to watch, and it's on Netflix again, um, Star Trek, the original, and now, you know, the next generation. It reminds me when Captain Picard got kind of assimilated into the Borg. What was the Borg? It was a collective. It was a collective of thinking. They, they all thought the same way. They all acted the same way. And so, that's kind of what this kind of begins to remind me, is that we're all trying to be assimilated to one collective thinking and entity. Their way or the highway. And this is what Paul is telling us, that the high-minded agenda centers will speak slanderously and reproachfully and will rail against and bring abusive, demeaning, and, re and degrading accusations against those with whom they disagree with. That's what we're finding here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 under the word blasphemers. And they will do this because they see themselves, again, as intellectually advantaged above everybody else. And anybody that they disagree with, they will deem to be primitive or resistant to progress and change. And because of that, they will disdain, mock, slander, and speak ill of them. So therefore, in the last days, 
it will seem as if manners will be completely removed from society altogether and people will begin to speak things that formerly would have been looked at as shameful. So the, the truth is then, I think it's just downright shocking nowadays what's said in movies and on television and by our elected officials. I mean, I'm telling you, the rude, crude things people say about each other, the insulting jokes they make about God, perfectly fulfill his, this word blasphemous or blasphemo. You know, one of the things I've always enjoyed, I love comedy. And I love watching good comedians, man. And many times my son, John Michael, and I, you know, we'll try to catch something uh, on, on Netflix uh, to watch that's a comedian. You know, we're checking out new comedians and, and see if we can't find a good one that, you know, is hilariously funny. But uh, lately, though, it seems like every comedian that we choose to watch on Netflix is so foul and filthy that after a few moments, we've got to shut them off. And I'm not talking about, you know, just a little cuss word here and there. I'm talking about filthy. I mean, the stuff they're saying out of their mouth is, 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 is beyond what I consider reasonable crude. I mean, it, just, and yet it is acceptable. It's acceptable where people are thinking it's funny, We're talking about anatomy, body parts, sexual positions, and and talking about fat people, skinny people, ugly people. And, and, and you know, it's just downright nasty. And, and it, you know, I should know better, but it says mature audience. But when it says mature audience, man, that doesn't even begin to facilitate the warning label that ought to be on it. Explicitly mature audience. And if you're over 50, close your ears because you're going to learn some new words. And, um, but... What's shocking to me is that this is becoming acceptable behavior in society. You know, we use the word, um, um, well, I'm not even going to say it. You know, the acronym is for unlawful carnal knowledge. And, you know, it, it's, it's everywhere. That word is just everywhere. And it used to be one of those words that you never used, except maybe when you got angry. Now everybody uses it. I mean, you can't use a paragraph without the F word in it. You can't even use a sentence without the F word in it. And it's an accepted word. Why? Because society has made it so. And the Holy Spirit plainly says that all these things are going to occur in the last days. And if we're living in those days then what we're going to see is countless signs that are going to confirm that we are and we're going to have to guard ourselves so that we do not fail, fall prey to these end time vices. And so, with that said, I think next week we're going to pick up with um, the next one, disobedient to parents. Woohoo! I know every child can't wait to hear that one, but disobedient to parents. And that's going to be our next prophetic sign that we'll look at that, that will decidedly mark the end of the age is a se severe increase of disobedience to parents. Hallelujah. Well, I trust you got something out of this this morning. Uh, I know it's a, it's a topic that we tread lightly on, but yet at the same time, it's a topic that we have to... Uh, put the information out there to help us to kind of determine where we're actually at in the time frame of God. I don't do it with a malice heart or ill intent, but I want, the, I want us to understand exactly what we're seeing is not something that is surprising to God. He's prepared the church to be in this place and in this time and in this dispensation to bring light, the light, the light of the gospel to a lost and dying world. People act this way because they don't know the truth. They don't know that there's life. A life that is so good. You know, people think that many times that being a Christian is, is lame. It's sad. We've made a, a bad decision. That was my best decision I ever made. And I know that without a shadow of a doubt, 
I have a Father who loves me unconditionally. And maybe this morning you're watching this broadcast and maybe you don't have that assurance. I know that there's an end that's coming. The Bible says it. I also know that the Spirit of God bears witness on my insides that Jesus is the Christ. How did I get that? One day I accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. And the Bible says that then the Spirit himself bears witness. Maybe you need that witness this morning that Jesus is real. You're looking around in dismay and disbelief at everything you're saying, that you're seeing. And man, it's troubling and frustrating at what's going on in society today. Maybe you don't understand it, but it's already been documented in the Word of God. The first place we always start is a relationship with Jesus. You don't have a relationship with Jesus, meaning that you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Just a few moments, I'm going to give you that opportunity. I'm going to tell you how to become part of the family of God. But I want to speak to you, to those of you who have already accepted Jesus, who are part of his kingdom. But for some reason, you've, you've laid it down and you've walked away and you've gone back into society's rules. We're seeing more and more people that are rising up and said, you know what? God's wrong. A society is right. And I'm walking away. Maybe you happen to be one of those people. Maybe you just walked away because you got hurt, you got bitter, you got mad at God. I know 25 years ago, I did the same thing and I walked away from God and I went on a four-year vacation from God and I thought I was living life and having a great time. But the reality of it was I was not. God loved me enough. He didn't forsake me, but he continually just gently and lovingly called me and prepared me to come home. And one day I woke up and I said, that's enough. I've had enough of this riotous, sinful living. I miss the life that I had. I miss my first love, Jesus. What did I do? I just knelt down and I said, God, according to 1 John 1, 9, you said that if I confess my sins, you're faithful and just to forgive me. And I asked God to forgive me. And I stood up that day, washed and cleansed. Got myself back in church. You know, Church isn't perfect. Pastors aren't perfect. But they still have a family unit that we can become a part of. Families still hurt each other. But thank God that we can grow beyond those hurts. I got back in church and began to, to grow and to, to learn and to develop. And then I moved into a place where I began to stand in the purpose that God had called Kim and I for. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you just need to just get on your knees and say, God, forgive me. Help me. I need your help. Forgive me of all my sins. According to 1 John 1, 9. Stand up, rise up, washed and cleansed. Find yourself a good church. Grow, develop, and move forward. Doesn't mean you're not going to get knocked down again. Doesn't mean you're not going to get hurt again. Man, it's a lot easier to go through things with God than without Him. But maybe you don't know the Father. Maybe you've never had the opportunity to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you haven't even started your journey. Then 1 John 1, 9 is not going to work for you. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 is the scripture that will definitely work for you, which says that if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be saved. That Greek word saved is sodizozo. It just means to be made whole spirit, soul, and body. What it denotes is that without Jesus, we're unhealthy. We're not whole. Well, how do I do that, Pastor? How do I, how do I become whole? Well, I invite you to just pray this prayer along with me. As you do, something wonderful and instantaneous is going to happen. Jesus is going to come into your heart and become Lord of your life. The Bible says that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We're going to call upon the name of the Lord, and I guarantee you that as we pray, you will be saved. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Pray this prayer with me right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you 
to forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. According to your word, I believe in my heart and now confess with my mouth that you were raised from, this, from the dead. From this moment forward, I am born again, saved, on my way to heaven, and a new creation in Christ Jesus. Man, let me be the first, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, to welcome you to the family of God. On your screen right now is a email address. Man, I want to get a little booklet that would just help you. It's just a little small booklet that will help you understand exactly what has just occurred in your life. Give you just a little understanding, a little bit of knowledge. You know, faith begins where the will of God is. And then we also want to be able to maybe help you get into a good Bible-believing church in your area if you're not in the San Antonio area. If you're in the San Antonio area, we invite you to stop by, drop in, and check us out at 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway. 6995 Alamo Downs Parkway, right here in the Alamo City, uh, when the campuses are open again. Hallelujah. Well, again, it's been good to have you with us and good to have you on campus. Uh, uh, digitally. Man, if you're watching this video after the fact and you like it on YouTube, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching it on our, our Facebook Live and like our page, we'd appreciate the opportunity to serve you through our social media community and um, have you become part of the family. During the week, we put up daily devotionals that will help you just to think on the things of God and meditate on the things of God. And then I want to also remind you that on Thursday nights, beginning at 7 p.m. every Thursday night, is, our, uh, is Amplify, which is our midweek Bible study where we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living it. We're hearing it, we're seeing it, and then we're going out and living it, man. 7 p.m. every Thursday night right here on Facebook Live or our YouTube channel. Hallelujah. And this week, we're going to continue. This will be our, our last, um, I believe, Thursday night on our biblical guidance to prayer. So join us as we wind this series down and begin on uh, next week. We'll probably begin looking at faith again. So man, it's been good having you with us. I'll see you next week right back here at 11 a.m. And here's Grace Church, where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts.